Ecuador is in the middle of a narco war, but what's really going on? Everyone knows by now that Ecuador has become one of the most important hubs for cocaine exportation in South America, and has since descended into an orgy of chaos, violence, and even the assassination of a presidential candidate last year. Then on January 8th of this year, a notorious gang leader nicknamed Fito, head of Los Chonoras street gang, escaped from a maximum security prison outside of Guayaquil, setting off a brutal wave of homicides and massacres between warring gangs and forcing the government to declare martial law. But what has actually been driving all of the bloodshed in Ecuador over the past five years? Drug trafficking, obviously. But how? How does a sophisticated, secretive, multi-billion dollar transnational industry like cocaine trafficking cause ghetto violence in Ecuadorian slums and prisons? Before we get into the video, hit that like and subscribe button and turn on your alerts to get notified whenever we drop new content. Okay, so how does it work? How and why do multi-millionaire, even multi-billionaire drug trafficking groups cause so much violence in a small, supposedly neutral country like Ecuador? To understand that, you must first know who these players are and why they choose Ecuador as the spot to set it off. So just in case you're not aware, let's catch you up to date with some of the facts. One third of all the cocaine that gets shipped out of Colombia, the biggest manufacturer of cocaine in the world, passes through Ecuador. One third. 70% of the cocaine that makes it to Europe gets first shipped out of Ecuador. It's estimated that cocaine is now one of the country's biggest exports among legal and illegal goods. But why? Number one, it's a poor, underdeveloped country. Drug traffickers love this. It's almost a prerequisite. This makes it extremely easy to bribe law enforcement officials, obviously. Look at how corrupt Mexico is and consider that it's a rich country compared to Ecuador. That should give you an idea of how easy it is for wealthy drug traffickers to manipulate police and politicians. It's got a weak security apparatus. Ecuador has never had these problems of drug trafficking and narco violence until 15 years ago at most. They were completely unprepared, not like in Colombia or Mexico or even Brazil who've had these problems for decades. At the port of Guayaquil, for example, they don't have any working scanners to check the outbound containers for cocaine. They rely on drug-sniffing dogs. And because of limited manpower, they're only able to search a fraction of the containers leaving the port every day. Number two, the banana industry. Ecuador has some of the largest banana plantations in the world and is the chief exporter of bananas in South America. This provides excellent cover for drug traffickers. European and Mexican drug trafficking groups are able to set up banana companies and hide literally tons of cocaine amongst the vast containers of fruit that leave the port of Guayaquil every day, which I just mentioned before has almost zero effective port security. But it gets even wilder. Number three, Ecuador uses American money. They changed over from the Ecuadorian peso to the US dollar about 20 years ago. This makes it incredibly easy to launder money. You see, all international illegal drug transactions are made using US currency. So if an Albanian trafficking network is buying a load of cocaine from a Colombian drug trafficking organization, they do it using US dollars. So if I'm a DTO based in Ecuador and I just received $10 million, let's say, in cash from a deal I did in Europe, I don't have to smuggle those dollars out of the country or pay a high tax to get them converted into the local currency. I can keep that money in Ecuador and start pumping it back into real estate, luxury goods, and other legitimate companies. And finally, and most importantly, it's geography. Ecuador is sandwiched between two of the biggest cocaine producing nations in the world, Colombia and Peru. And the port of Guayaquil, one of the busiest ports in the Western Hemisphere, sits conveniently on the Pacific coast and is a straight shot north to Central America and Southern Mexico. Ecuador is a drug trafficking paradise. That's why it's starting to look like Colombia of the early 1990s, or more recently, the drug wars in Mexico, with decapitated bodies hanging from freeway overpasses and politicians getting gunned down in broad daylight. So who's doing all this killing? Well, the short answer is street gangs, who have morphed into prison gangs who now control the street activity from the inside, much the way that American gangs like the Mexican Mafia or the Aryan Brotherhood operate. These aren't the kingpins. No coca leaf is grown in Ecuador, and therefore no cocaine produced. The Ecuadorians, quite frankly, are glorified errand boys. The more important question is, what is driving all this violence? The answer to that comes down to the puppet masters pulling the strings. The main players dominating the Ecuadorian drug trade are as follows. Number one, 
the Albanians. In case you're unaware, Albanians are some of the biggest gangsters in Europe. Something about the brutality of the Balkans under communism and the very insular, clannish nature of Albanian culture have made them top tier criminals. They say it was the late 1990s when the first enterprising Albanians landed in Ecuador to seek their fortune in the virgin cocaine industry. It was attractive to them because unlike other countries in South America at the time, Europeans didn't need a visa to enter Ecuador. These Albanian pioneers weren't content to purchase purchased bricks in Europe at $60,000 a piece wholesale. They wanted the best price. They wanted to meet the plug. This was revolutionary. No other European or American gang had ever done this, gone straight to the connect. Over the next few generations, they gradually started integrating themselves into Ecuadorian society, starting families, opening businesses, and making contacts in the ports of Guayaquil and Puerto Bolivar. And in doing so, they managed to create a literal cocaine superhighway from Ecuador to Europe. Here's how it works. Albanian traffickers purchase bulk cocaine shipments from Colombian brokers acting on behalf of the drug lords in the southernmost regions of Colombia, called Nariña and Putamayo. These drug cartels are today offshoots of the now defunct FARC rebels, a far-left guerrilla group that disbanded a few years ago, and the Gaitanistas, a right-wing paramilitary group that is said to be the last remnants of the Medellin cartel. The cocaine, and we're talking thousands of kilos at a time, is then smuggled over the border into Ecuador, where it is handed off to the care of Ecuadorian smuggling gangs and transported to safe houses in and around the port of Guayaquil. Then, using an astonishing network of corrupt port employees, these gangs are able to hide the cocaine shipments amongst the legal products, like bananas, destined for Europe. Once the cargo ship carrying the merchandise leaves the port of Guayaquil, it heads north, passing through the Panama Canal and then makes a beeline across the Atlantic Ocean all the way to the ports of Rotterdam, Netherlands, and Antwerp in Belgium, where they're met and offloaded by more corrupt employees who are also in the pockets of Albanian gangsters. It's estimated that after bribes and transport fees, the Albanians are paying around $3,000 per kilo in Guayaquil and are able to turn around and sell each one wholesale when it reaches Europe for $35,000 to $40,000. That's a $30,000 profit per kilo. Now multiply that times 1,000 kilos, you've got a $30 million profit. That is serious business. And they're just the middlemen, technically. After all, the Albanians don't actually grow the coca leaf, compress and mix the coca paste, or manufacture the cocaine bricks. This is still done by the Colombian groups who I mentioned earlier. The FARC guerrillas and the ELN, the Grupo Autodefensa, which is a right-wing paramilitary organization that was created to challenge the FARC, both of these groups have been growing coca leaf and taxing the sale of cocaine paste in the Amazon regions of Colombia for decades. But then in 2016, the FARC finally signed a peace treaty with the Colombian government and officially laid down its arms. As part of that agreement, the government essentially legalized the growing of coca leaf in FARC-controlled regions. This caused an explosion in coca leaf production and consequently, the last five years have seen record levels of cocaine production and export from Colombia. Many of these FARC members, to the surprise of no one, have now become fully-fledged cocaine traffickers and utilize the same route south into Ecuador and through the port of Guayaquil just like the Albanians. Their competition is the ELN and many of the splinter organizations who have sprouted up after the fall of Dairo Antonio Usaga David, AKA Otonial. He was the kingpin and leader of the Gulf Clan, or Clan del Golfo, which is based in the north of Colombia. He got arrested and extradited to the US back in 2021. Not only are these groups wreaking havoc in the southern districts of Colombia, they too are helping to drive the astronomical homicide rate in Ecuador, as they muscle in for their share of the lucrative European cocaine market. But by far, the most powerful players in this dirty affair between Colombia, Ecuador, and Europe are the Mexican super cartels, Sinaloa and the Jalisco New Generation Cartel. Now what's happening with these two Mexican cartels, especially Sinaloa, is that they've gone global. The Sinaloa cartel is said to have the biggest footprint in Spain, where they've turned the port of Algeciras into one of the biggest offloading sites for cocaine into Southern Europe. Just like what the Albanians have done with the port of Antwerp and Rotterdam in Northern Europe. 
Furthermore, these cartel giants still have their American markets. Despite all the hype around the European boom, the biggest consumer of cocaine in the world is still the United States. And although the wholesale price is much lower than in a place like Belgium or the Netherlands, reports show that kilo prices are starting to stabilize from their post-pandemic lows. Plus, now the cartels are aggressively going after the Canadian market, which is extremely lucrative. I'm actually going to do a separate video just about that. The Ecuador to Mexico to US route looks something like this. The cocaine shipments leave southern Colombia over the border into Ecuador. But instead of heading south to the port of Guayaquil to be loaded onto cargo ships, the way drugs destined for Europe are, these bricks are stashed in the northern port cities, like Esmeraldas and Manta. From there, they're smuggled onto fishing vessels, go-fast boats, and semi-submersible submarines, which then head southwest around the Galapagos Islands and out of the range of radar. Then they head back north towards Central America, where they're either offloaded in places like Guatemala, or they just refuel there and head straight for Mexico, where the smugglers unload the ships in cartel strongholds around the coasts of Chiapas and Oaxaca. Now these waters have been getting hot lately. Maritime transport is becoming harder due to increased law enforcement, so they've started flying much of these smaller loads, 500 to 1,000 kilos, in private planes and then smuggling them overland from Central America into Mexico. But the Mexican cartels aren't just trafficking cocaine to Europe and North America. Get this, they are now funding and operating coca leaf growing inside of Colombia. That's right, they are starting to control every level of the supply chain. Here's what a Reuters article just said about this. The Mexican cartels have driven significant changes in the varieties of coca being planted, sending cocaine production higher, Colombia's anti-narcotics police say. These developments in how coca is grown have contributed to the increased quantity and purity of cocaine trafficked to both the United States and Europe, according to police. This is unprecedented. The mega cartels of Mexico have taken advantage of the chaos that ensued in southern Colombia after 2016, when the FARC disbanded, and now not only own much of the land where the coca leaf is grown, they supervise the harvests, they ensure quality control, they hire out the Colombian labor, and then they purchase the cocaine after it's been manufactured back from these peasant farmers. So they, the Colombians, depend on Mexican drug traffickers in Colombia. Then, of course, they organize the smuggling south into Ecuador. Just like the Albanians and Colombians, they leverage their money and their contacts to smuggle the loads either onto cargo ships bound for Europe or planes and smaller ships destined for Mexico and ultimately the United States. This has never happened before in the history of the drug trade. This would be like if the Colombians were operating and growing sin semilla pot back in Mexico in the 1970s. It's a complete coup for the Mexican cartels, the super cartels, Sinaloa and Jalisco. They've become vertically integrated from supply and manufacturing to transportation and finally distribution. So how does this all cause violence and bloodshed in Ecuador? Are cartel members from Mexico having shootouts with Albanians in the streets of Guayaquil? Absolutely not. Rich men don't do this. The chaos, bloodshed, and brutality in Ecuador is done by the Ecuadorian street gangs themselves. Gangs like Los Choneros, Los Tiguerones, and Los Lobos. They're the ones who do the dirty work for the rich men. Smuggling and stashing cargo, loading it onto cargo ships and planes, kidnapping fishermen and forcing or paying them to haul cocaine loads in their vessels up the coast. They collect and deliver the payments and carry out murder if this payment doesn't arrive. But they kill each other for dominance at the ports of Guayaquil and Esmeraldas. It's because their livelihoods are made by charging a small handling fee, as low as $100 per kilo during Chapo's time, and now maybe as high as $2,000 per kilo. Furthermore, because so much cocaine passes through the country, there is now a small but growing internal demand, especially for cocaine base, or base as they call it down there which is the South American equivalent of crack cocaine, a poor man's high for a poor country. These gangs who control the sale in and out of prison quite naturally make war on each other for market share. So there you have it. Ecuador has turned into another epicenter of drug trafficking and narco violence. And it'll keep getting worse until the law comes down so hard on these street gangs, the way it is in El Salvador, that it will force traffickers to find new geographies and new routes to get their product to market. But one thing's for sure, won't never stop. All right, you guys, that's been today's episode. Drop us a like, leave us a comment about a subject that you want us to talk about on this channel. We're dropping multiple videos a week. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time.